Church, you may be seated. Uh, man, I'm so excited that you're here today. I want to be brief, but I want to introduce to you our guest speaker for the day. His name is Brian Clark. Brian is a missionary to London with his wife Mindy and their four children that are here with us today. I'll let him introduce them to you uh, as he does, pleases to do that. Brian and I go back a long time. I don't know where I first met Brian. It might have been at Bible College somewhere in Springfield, Missouri, I'm sure. Uh, but we've run into each other off and on through the years. I had an opportunity. They were with us years ago now. Um, I had an opportunity to take a small team from our church to London to minister with Brian. Uh, you guys have heard me tell stories from time to time on the streets of London uh, wearing red shirts that said, no religion, just Jesus. I think that's what they said. And uh, I, I remember feeling a lot like Moses, like like because we were standing sometimes in the middle of crowded streets of people, and we're wanting to engage them and talk to them about Jesus. But it was just like the Red Sea had split wide open, and everybody just went as far around us as they possibly could. And uh, so, but man, we had a lot of great conversations, and Brian really taught us and helped us, um, you know, learn to share our faith in in the way that they had been doing, and yet. At the same time, um, hopefully making contacts for them to follow up on for some time to come. And so, really glad that, Brian, you're with us today. Come on up here. We're looking forward to hearing you preach the word. So let's give him a hand as he comes. I love you, man. Well, it, is, um, it is really nice to be here. Um, it's always a pleasure to be able to see Alan again. Um, I love him a lot. He's a dear brother. And uh, that was a good trip. It was a good team that came over. We spent a lot of good time on the street and stuff like that. And uh, where is my family? Where? That's them right there. And uh, I have to introduce them, uh, and they don't like that. But uh, this is my wife, Mindy, and uh, my daughter, Caitlin, my daughter, Madison, my uh, son, Stefan. And this is my other son, uh, Hudson, over here. Uh, but that's really enough of them, because this is really about me, okay? So, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I am a missionary uh, to London, uh, just like your pastor is, is a missionary. And, um, but really, the truth is, is that um, I'm just a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, there was a time uh, that a guy, also named Brian, he discipled me, one-on-one. -on -one. He spent about a year discipling me, and he just opened up the Bible, and uh, he just showed me from the Bible how I was supposed to have a personal relationship with Christ and also how I was, how I was meant. It was God's high calling on my life to reproduce myself in the life of other people. And it was about halfway through that process that I realized that this is what I was going to do for the rest of my life. Um, discipleship is that's that's what changed my life and I think that if we look at the biblical record that's exactly what it's that's exactly what is meant to happen being discipled is what prepares you for everything else that is to come um, one thing I can tell you and it's something that I know that you already know is that when you get to heaven um, uh, nobody there is going to ask you about your attendance record I don't know if you knew that, but nobody in heaven cares uh, how often or how good your attendance record was at church. And sadly, in the West, uh, a, a Christian's life and their mission in life has been relegated uh, almost completely to their attendance record. And if you're really dedicated to Christ, then you'll bring somebody else so that they can attend with you. And so we've become a, just a bunch of attenders. You know, the sad statistics out there is that the vast majority, I, I can't remember what it is, it's somewhere over 85% of all Christians uh, will never share their faith with anyone for the entirety of their life. Did you guys know that? The vast majority of people will never do that. But let me tell you something else that's true. What else is true is that the vast majority of Christians that I meet, they really want to be soul winners. Because that's, that's our calling, that's our responsibility, that's what a disciple of Jesus Christ does, 
is he reproduces himself. And that starts with sharing the gospel and leading someone to Christ. And then we take them and we grow them up in the Lord. But it begins with us being willing and being bold, but also being meek enough to be able to share the gospel with other people. And the vast majority of people will never do that. I just have to accept that that's the fact. But I also believe, based on my own experience, that most Christians really want to be soul winners. They just simply don't know how to do that. But the question that I want to ask you this morning is, why should we bother? Why should we bother uh, trying to overcome our flesh in this battle that we're in, which is, which is always required if you're going to lead people to Christ? Because you have to be the gospel as well as declare the gospel. And why would we bother to do that? Why would we bother going through all the hassle of trying to share the gospel with people, knowing the kind of response that we're going to get, right? I get rejected all the time when I'm sharing the gospel with people. Um, and it's just something that we have to live with. Me and my son, Stefan, we'd go out there on the high street to share the gospel with people. So in order to pass the time, we'll have a little competition to see, we'll say like, uh, over the next 15 minutes, let's see who can get rejected the most. That'll be like our little competition, right? Just to keep it fun, right? And, um, and the one who gets rejected the worst, now that's the real winner. Um, so we, we get rejected. Why would we go through the trouble of doing that? Why would we go through the trouble of rocking the boat in our families or at work? Why would we run the risk of maybe losing a job because we stand for Christ and we share our faith? Why would we do that? Do you guys like ice cream? Anybody? Raise the hands, right? These are the people who are right with the Lord <laughs> right there. The people who like ice cream. I, I love ice cream. Uh, I, I share this everywhere I go, and I do this in the hopes that someone will give me ice cream. <laughs> That's really true. I do love ice cream so much, and Mindy walked in the other night, I was rubbing it on my face. I, I love ice cream so much, uh, maybe a little too much. Now, my question is, why in the world would I not just spend the rest of my life sitting in front of Netflix eating ice cream. Do you guys have Bluebell down here? Oh, my gosh. Oh, yes, it does. It is so delicious. Now, if I had a bowl of Bluebell homemade vanilla style, and I just sit and I just binge watch my favorite shows and just allow the blue light of the television to wash all my problems away, why would I not spend my life doing that? It's so nice, isn't it? It's so comfortable. Why in the world would I not spend my life? And of course, you got to go to work because you got to. Before pay. we came to Christ, we were spiritual lepers. We had a fatal disease that lives in our flesh. Do you follow with me? And that's called sin, and there's no cure for it. It doesn't matter how many times you come to church, it doesn't matter how nice you are to your wife. It doesn't matter how good you are to your kids. It doesn't matter if you're a good citizen. It doesn't matter if you vote for the right person, as if there was one. It doesn't matter what you do in society. It doesn't matter if you don't cheat on your taxes. It doesn't matter if you always tell the truth. There's no cure for it. It will kill you. It's fatal. And there's nothing that you can do to turn that around. It's too late. And not, not only were they lepers, but it says they were in the middle of a war. They were up in the northern part of the kingdom, up by Samaria, and the Syrians had completely surrounded the place in siege warfare. So they're surrounded by war. We were born into a spiritual war, weren't we? We don't wrestle against the flesh and blood. We're, we may not be in, engaged in a physical war, even though some of us might have to do that. But we're engaged in a spiritual war against spiritual wickedness in high places. We were born into that war. And not only that, but it says, here's the Christmas bonus, there's a famine. As if things aren't bad enough, man. These guys have leprosy that they're going to die from. They're surrounded by war, and they're all starving to death. 
So that kind of sucks, right? So they're lepers, they're in the middle of a war, and then they're in the middle of a famine. And that's a reminder to us that that's exactly the kind of world that we were born into. Amos chapter 8 tells us that we live in a famine, not of bread, but of hearing the Word of God. It is a reminder to us that when you walk out the, those doors today, back into the world, it's a reminder that there is nothing for you out there. There is nothing out there that can feed your soul. And, and we keep looking for it, don't we? Uh, we keep scrolling on Instagram, just hoping that there's going to be a reel, which I think is such an ironic title for those things. But they keep scrolling through the reels, just hoping that we'll find the secret to how I can finally, you know, be attractive to my wife and how I can fix my kids and how I can fix my finances and how I can finally be safe and be secure and be somebody. But you won't find it because there's nothing out there that they can give us that will actually feed our souls. And we just keep filling ourselves with it and filling ourselves. And the more we do, the more empty we are. It is a famine out there. It's also a reminder to us that the people who are still out there are, in fact, starving to death. That's the world that these guys were born into. And so they look around and they say, what are we going to do? Are we going to just sit here till we die? And this guy gives them some options. He says, we have three options. He says, we can go back into the city and you can do that too. You have these same three options. You can go back into the world if you want to. He says, but there's a famine, so we're just going to die. He says, we can stay where we are and you can do that as well. You can choose not to choose. You can say, you know what, I just like things the way they are. I'm just going to keep the status quo. I'm just going to stay where I'm at. I've kind of figured out how that I can get along and uh, get by on my own personal respectable sins, and I'm fine. I'm just going to stay where I'm at. And this guy says, we can do that. He says, but if we stay here, we're just going to die. He says, what if we run out to our enemy? What if we run out to our enemy and maybe they'll have mercy on us? And give us some food so that we can live. But he says, but if, if they don't, then they're just going to kill us, which is cool because we're going to die anyway. And my first question is, who invited this guy to the party? <laughs> this guy is like the most depressing friend in all the world. He's like, we've got three options, you know, just death on every side. But we might live if the enemy gives us a little bit of mercy. We might be able to live. And that's exactly who we were. Ephesians tells us that when we were without Christ, that we were in the world and we had no hope. That's who we were, spiritual lepers surrounded by war in the middle of a famine, our souls starving to death. And we only had three options. We could run to the world, we could stay where we are, or we could run to our enemy. According to Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, did you know that before you came to Christ, that's exactly who God was? He was your enemy, and you had made him your enemy because of your sin. You and God are enemies because of you. It's your fault. It's not his. It's your fault. You have made him your enemy, and you make him more and more your enemy every day that you stand in opposition to him. But maybe you're thinking, I've really only got one choice. What if I run to my enemy? And maybe I can find some mercy. And that's exactly what these lepers did. They got up the courage and they said, we're going to run out to our enemy. And when they ran out there, what did they discover? And you see such an overlapping picture here. It's so beautiful because they find when they come out to the camp to try to find mercy from their enemy, they discover that God in the night had defeated their enemy for them. And isn't that exactly what you found? Maybe you remember the day. Isn't that exactly what you found when you came to the cross and you discovered that God the Father, through his son Christ Jesus, had defeated your real enemy, which is sin and death, for you already? And you discovered that there was already victory that had been won for you through Christ. Isn't that what you found yes, sir. when you came to Christ? That's exactly what these men found. These lepers, not only did they come to this crossroads just like you, and you have to make a decision which way you're going to go. And you have no choice 
but to make a decision. Now, you can stay, you can go back, or you can come to Christ. Those are your only three choices. And they made their choice, and what happens was, you see in verse 8, these lepers discovered a treasure. Do you see in verse 8? It says, when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into the tent. And you can remember that day, if you've ever come to Christ, you may not know what day it was or what time it was, and that's okay, but you do remember that it happened. And there was a time that you came into that tent. There was a time that you came into Christ. And what did you discover? What did you receive when you came into that tent? When you came into Christ, they came into the one tent and they did eat and drink. Finally, we found something that could feed our souls. Just like we observed here, we found the bread and the wine. We found the body of Christ. We found the blood of Christ. That's exactly what these men found. We, I want you to look at a few scriptures with me so that we can see this. And first of all, I want you to see Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. Now, I'm, I want you to actually turn to these passages, if you will, because I want you to see these passages for yourself. I believe these to be life-changing passages. When we see what we discovered, when we came to Christ, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15 the first thing we see is, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage. That's what we found when we came to Christ, that he had defeated our enemy for us. But if you turn over to John chapter 6, verse 35, John chapter 6, verse 35, what did we find when we came into that tent? Now, we're not going to have a ton of scriptures, so just a few, so stick with me. John chapter 6, verse 35. When we came into that tent, after we discovered what he had done through the cross in defeating our enemy, we came into Christ, and Jesus said in John 6, 35, unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. That's what we first found. We found something to eat. We found something to drink the kind that could finally satisfy our soul. That is what we found. Just like these four lepers who came into the tent, they finally found something to eat and drink. That's exactly what we found in Christ. And if we come to him, he says, if you come to me who is the bread of life, you shall never hunger. If you believe on me, you shall never thirst. But that's not all that they found. When they came into this tent, it says they carried thence silver and gold. They also found this treasure, didn't they? Not only of food, but a, a monetary gain of silver and gold. But what does 2 Corinthians chapter 8, turn over with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, what does it say that we found when we came into this tent? 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Second Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, what does it say that we found when we came into Christ? It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be what? Rich. rich. That's what we found when we came to Christ. It's what Paul calls over in Ephesians chapter 3, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Not only did we find that meat and drink, but we found riches. We found silver and gold, but that's, that's not my favorite one. It says when they came into that tent that they also carried away raiment. They found clothes. And isn't that exactly what we found? If you turn over to Isaiah chapter 61, Isaiah chapter 61, if you don't turn to any other passage, the whole rest of this sermon, please turn to this one, Isaiah 61. I hope that you will highlight this one. 
I hope you'll mark it down and go home and memorize it later. This is just the most amazing verse. Isaiah 61 and verse 10. He says, Isaiah says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. That's what he did for me when I got saved. It's what Martin Luther calls the great exchange. He took all of my sin and he put it on Christ. And he took all of the righteousness of Christ, who is God in the flesh, who is perfect and holy. He took all of his righteousness and he clothed my soul with it. So that now, because of Christ, I am forgiven for free forever. That's what, that's what he did for me. Knowing the things that I've done, he did that for me. And not only the things that I've done, but the things that I'm going to do tomorrow. That even when I sin tomorrow, the black mark and the ugliness of my sin still goes on to Christ while I remain clean. That's how forgiven I am. It's not that he gave me a, a, a redo and then I have to try to grip my teeth and hold out to the end. No, he washed me completely clean forever. All of my sins in the past and in the future are already under the blood. They're already forgiven. I am perfected in his eyes forever through his sacrifice that he gave for me. That's what he did for me. And that's exactly what happened to us when we came to Christ. That's what it means to get saved. That's what it means to be born again. And that's what these guys discovered when they came in. But that's not really the part of the story that I want you to see. If you go back to 2 Kings chapter 7, what I want you to see is a question. When they found this eat and drink and they carried then silver and gold and raiment, what did they do with it? What did these men do with this treasure that they had found? It's, it's almost too difficult to say. And you, and you judge them a little bit when you look at that. They took this, they're carrying the, the food and, and the gold, they're just filling their pockets with it. They got some big leg of lamb under their arm and they're throwing the clothes over their shoulder and they're coming back to their tents. It says they had to go back a second time. There was so much stuff they had to come back a second time, a second trip, to carry this treasure away. So they go and hide it in their tents. And you read that and you think, how in the world could they do that? How? There's a whole city that's right behind them that is starving to death. And they're just hiding all the treasure. And we're reminded when we look at that, we, we say, well, now, these guys are clearly a picture of us before we came to Christ. They're clearly a picture of us when we met Christ, when we got saved. Is, is this a picture of us too? Is this what we've done with the treasure that he's given us? Do we just take it and we just come to church every Sunday and we just fill our pockets with it? We have to make multiple trips because there's there's so much treasure in this book. There's so much wonderful things to eat. And we're reminded every time that we take communion that he's clothed our soul with this righteousness and we take it home and we fill our pockets and we stick it under our arms and we throw those clothes over our shoulder and we go home and we just stick it underneath our bed. And, and, and why? 
Be, because we don't want to mess up Christmas with our family. We don't want to ruin the day. We don't want to rock the boat. God forbid we make anybody feel uncomfortable. We, we hide it away, and why? Because, because we're embarrassed of him? We're embarrassed of him? The one who clothed my soul with righteousness? The one who took me, who didn't deserve anything that he ever gave me? I deserve for him to take me and throw me right into hell. That's exactly what I deserve. And I, I knew that I deserved that. And then I, I hesitate to say anything because, because why? Because I'm embarrassed of him. Is this a picture of us as well? The Bible tells us that if the gospel is hid, that it is hid to those who are lost. Are we hiding what we have found from those who need it the most? There's a whole city that's right out there, guys, and they're starving to death. There's people out there who really want to know the truth, who really want to know about Jesus Christ. If only somebody was, had the boldness to go and talk to them about it, to go and share it with them. In, in Romans chapter 1, verse 14, don't turn there, but in Romans chapter 1, verse 14, uh, Paul says that I'm a debtor to those who are lost to preach the gospel to them. Do you know what that means? Do you know what he means when he says, I'm a debtor to them? He, what he's saying in a roundabout way is he's saying, because they are a human being, just like I am, he says, I owe it to them to tell them the truth. If I have the only cure to this spiritual leprosy, if I have the only food that there is, if I have the only real treasure that lasts forever, if I have the answer to everything that they're looking for, because they are a human being, I owe it to them to tell them. And what kind of person would, would keep that from someone who needs it? Why in the world would we ever do that? Just like we look at these guys and we ask that same question, why in the world would we do that? But the story's not over, because there is an answer to that. Something happened to these guys. They're, they're carrying all the stuff away and hide it in their tents, right? And then all of a sudden, something dawns, probably on that one jerk that's getting them started on this in the first place. Someone speaks up, something turns them around, something causes these guys to make a complete 180 and to say, wait a second, we've got to change course, we're doing the wrong thing. And you see what he says here as you carry on reading? He says, they said one to another, we do not well. Yeah, no kidding. We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings. That's the exact definition of gospel. This is a day of the gospel, and we hold our peace, that is many of us. We do not well, because we have the gospel, and yet we hold our peace. He says, if we tarry, look, now here's what turned them around. Do you see what he said? He says, if we tarry until the morning light, then some mischief will come upon us. And that word mischief, that, the, the Hebrew construction of that word means the idea is punishment. He says, if we tarry until the morning light, then some sort of bad punishment Something bad is going to happen to us, is what he said. And so what did they do? So they went and told the king, who told everybody, and then everyone comes out, you know, and they all get the, the treasure for themselves. But what was it that turned them around? What is it that makes us bother? What is it that makes us go through the trouble? What is it that keeps us from being selfish human beings that take this treasure and hide it away? What makes us turn around and decide we're going to go and tell everybody instead of keeping it to ourselves? The thing that changed their path was that they remembered that the sun was getting ready to rise. That's what turned them around. It wasn't their grit. It was that at some point as they're carrying the stuff away, one of the guys speaks up and he says, wait a second, guys. Uh, we're not really thinking this through. There's a flaw in our plan. He's saying pretty soon the sun is going to come up and everybody in the city, guess what? They're going to see that the enemy is gone anyway. Everybody's going to see the truth in the light of day. And the king is going to know at some point it's going to be discovered that we knew about it and didn't tell anybody. 
That's what turned them around. Now, think about what, is, what it is that we're waiting for. As we carry all these treasures that your pastor prepares for you every week, as we carry them home and we shove them under our beds, at some point we, it has to dawn on us, no, no pun intended, it has to dawn on us that we're not really thinking this plan through, are we? We're not really thinking it through. Because the Bible tells us, does it not? In Romans chapter 13 and verse 12, this is what the Apostle Paul tells his people. He says, the night is far spent, and the day is at hand. Paul tells them, he says, it's time for you to cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light, for you to put on Christ. He says, and why should we do that? Why should we bother to enter into this battle He says, because the night is far spent, because the sun is getting ready to rise. That is what we are waiting on. That's the next thing to happen on the timeline. There's coming a day when we're going to be caught up and we're going to stand before the Lord in the judgment seat. And 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 13 tells us that every man's works are going to be judged. And it says, and the day will reveal what sort they are. The sun is going to shine. Everyone's going to know the truth anyway. And your king is going to know that you knew and you told nobody. That is what turns us around. And I I think about these things. I think about the day that I'll have to stand before him. You remember the night that Christ was being judged as he stood before the judgment seat. Peter was out in the court and he was denying Christ, just like we do. And we're like, no, wait a minute, I come to church, Uh, who cares? Let's not fool ourselves, okay? And we, through our, we, we claim him, but in our works, we deny him all the time. And um, Peter was out there, he was denying Christ. And we, when he got to that third time, he begins to, to raise his voice. He begins to cuss, and he's trying to convince other people and maybe himself that he's not one of these Jesus people. And one of the Gospels tells us that when that happened, that Christ in the courtroom, he, said he heard him. And he turned around, and he looked at Peter, and Peter looked at him, and Peter remembered, and he went away and he cried. Now, I, don't think there's, I don't think there's a more pure picture of the judgment seat of Christ than that, because there's going to come a day when I'm going to have to stand in front of him, and I'm going to have to look him in the eyes. Is is that going to be a a revelation of of how I denied him? How will he look at me? How will I be able to look at him? Listen, I can tell you for for a fact, when it comes to all the trouble of the ministry, you know, the trouble, the the battle that you're in, uh, the battle that we face, all the difficulties and the obstacles that we overcome, all that is for real. When it comes to all that stuff, I can tell you for a fact that Uh, The people who have invested in my life, the people who went through the trouble to invest in my life, I can tell you for a fact that uh, I was not worth the trouble. I wasn't. I was not worth their time. I was not worth the bother. But he is. He is worth the trouble. He is worth the bother. This whole passage reminds us the reason why we bother, the reason why we do all of this, the reason why we go through the trouble, the reason why it's okay for you to feel uncomfortable sometimes, the reason why it's okay for you to actually engage in the battle, the reason why it's okay for you to tell the truth, the reason why it's okay for you to just do what is decent, to owe it to those people who are out there to tell them the truth about Jesus Christ, even though you're embarrassed and they're embarrassed and we're all embarrassed and it's all uncomfortable, but we do it anyway because it reminds us that we do not live for ourselves, 
We do not live for this world. We do not live for the night. We live for the sunrise. That is who we are. We know that the sun is going to come up very soon, and everybody's going to know the truth anyway. But most importantly, he's going to know. We're going to have to stare him in the face, and he's going to know that I knew, and I didn't tell anybody. And I can't live with that. That's what keeps me up at night. That's why we bother. Because very soon the sun is going to rise. I know that it's hard. So whenever you feel uncomfortable, this is the truth you remind yourself of. When you feel embarrassed, remember, it's a matter of fact. Just remember that the sun will rise. Whenever you feel uncomfortable, remember that the sun will rise. Whenever you start to get tempted to hide your treasures away, remember that the sun will rise. And remember that that is why we bother. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your word. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you would help us remember the truth. It's not really about how we feel. It's just remembering the truth that the sun is going to rise soon. And one day we're going to see you, Lord. One day we're going to look at you. One day we're going to stand before you. And we have to determine now, will that be a day of great rejoicing? Or will that be a day of great regret? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.